بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. This week, um, our presentation will be on the relationship between Islam and Christianity. Uh, our speaker last week um, touched on this in terms of, you know, the Christian and and uh, Old Testament and New Testament figures that are in the Quran that are mentioned in the Quran, you know, are not just mentioned but actually uh, really fully discussed in the Quran. Uh, and then, so we'll be bridging, bridging between that and next week's discussion, which will be on interfaith relations, um, to discuss, okay, what are the similarities between Christianity and Islam? What are the differences between the two? Uh, what is the relationship, uh, both, you know, we know what the relationship is now, but what has been the relationship historically? Uh, so that is what our speaker uh, today will be discussing, and our speaker, Get his name correct. It's Dr. Ali Atehi. Right? Um, it's listed here he had, that he's a PhD candidate, but I just realized he just told me that he is a PhD graduate now. Uh, uh, at GTU in Berkeley. And he is now a professor at Zaytuna College in Berkeley, which is, I just learned this morning is a first Muslim liberal arts college in America. Wow. So, uh, in addition to uh, teaching there, he's also a popular area speaker and educator on religion. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Lente. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, just a little bit about me first before I get into the topic. Um, I do have a PhD, as was stated. I have it in something called Islamic Biblical Hermeneutics. Uh, I did my dissertation on a, a Sufi interpretation of the Gospel of John. I have a master's in uh, New Testament, where I focus on biblical languages. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about, as was stated, the similarities and differences between Islam and Christianity, and kind of looking at it historically as well, and the sort of presentation um, of Christianity that is given in the Quran. Uh, so I want to begin by uh, telling you what I think is uh, something that we have in common, uh, Muslims and Christians and Jews for that matter, uh, what I believe is the heart of the Abrahamic tradition. Um, so there's a story about a rabbi in the second century name was Hillel, the great uh, Pharisaic rabbi and saint. He was asked, uh, what is the Torah in a nutshell? Right? So he quoted three verses. He quoted Deuteronomy 6.4, Deuteronomy 6.5, and Leviticus 19.18. We'll talk about those. And then he said, everything else is commentary. <laughs> Which is not to say it's not important, but he's giving you the essence of, of the Torah. And it's interesting because um, a century earlier, according to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, a Jewish scribe comes to Jesus and asks him, what is the greatest commandment? Right? And what does Jesus do? He quotes these three verses. Right? So Mark records them in Greek, but Jesus said them in Hebrew. <coughs> because he's quoting the Old Testament. And in the Quran, Jesus is quoted as saying that I confirm the theology of the Torah. So Jesus said, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he continues, Ve'ahavta et Adonai, Elohecha v'kul levavacha, v'kul nefshecha, v'kul me'odecha. And you shall love the Lord thy God with thy heart, soul, and strength. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Right? So this is the essence of the Abrahamic teaching. Now the Prophet Muhammad, as you probably are familiar with him a little bit now at this point, this is the third week, Muslims believe he's the final messenger of God. Um, uh, he has many hadith attributed to him. It's one of the words that you should be familiar with. H-A-D-I-T-H, maybe you've had this term in the past, something attributed to the Prophet. And there's a hadith attributed to him where he said, Translation, 
uh, none of you uh, will enter paradise until you, until you truly believe. And none of you will truly believe until you love one another. Right? And then he said, shall I tell you of something that will increase your love? And his companions, they're called Sahaba in Arabic, his disciples, if you will, they said, yes. And he said, salama baynakum. Spread peace amongst yourselves. Spread peace amongst yourselves. So this, this is extremely important. This is the heart of the tradition. There was a theologian named Fakhradin al-Razi. Everyone say, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so he was a, a Persian. He's very famous. Al-Razi, Imam al-Razi, R-A-Z-I, for those taking notes. And he was asked, much like Hillel was asked, what is the essence of Islam? And he said, al-Islam, he said, al-ibadatu lil-khaliq wa rahmatu lil-khaliq. He said, Islam is worship of the Creator, or adoration of the Creator, and showing mercy towards His creation. Right? So there's a lot of misconceptions that, you know, Islam is a, the, the, the God of Islam is a different God. For example, you hear that a lot. Muslims worship a different God. Now, I would say in principle, it is the same God. I think just a cursory glance or reading of the Quran makes it clear that at least the claim of the Quran is that the revealer of this text is the God of Abraham, right? Um, so in principle, the same God. I would say, however, when you get down to sort of the theological nitty gritty of things, there are differences between Jews, Muslims, and Christians. It's interesting. There was a second, late first century, early second century. Uh, Christian uh, sect called the, the Marcionites, or Marcionism. Uh, the founder of the sect, Marcion, he proposed this idea that you know, Christians worship a different god than the Christian, uh, than the Jewish god. That the Jewish god is an inferior god. Uh, he called him Yaldabaoth. He was vehemently anti-Semitic. Uh, he was a docetist. He was a bi-theist. So it was kind of trendy in Rome in the, in the beginning of the second century. But then the proto-Orthodox church fathers, like Justin Martyr and Irenaeus uh, and, and many others, they vehemently opposed this type of theology because they said, no, it's the same God. It's the God of Abraham. Christians don't worship a different God, right? So they rejected that type of, of polemic. But we theologize differently, right? For example, they would say that it's the same God, but we believe that this God revealed himself in a unique way, right? So I would say the same thing. I would say that, I would say that uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews, they worship the same God in principle, but there are differences when you study theology, how, how we theologize uh, about God. Uh, the name uh, of God in Arabic is Allah. Uh, Allah is simply, uh, well, there's a difference of opinion as to the etymology of that name. Some believe it's just the God, because Al in Arabic is a definite article. So al ilah became Allah. But that's a minority opinion. The dominant opinion is that the first two letters of the name Allah, which are Alif and Lam in Arabic, are cognate to the Hebrew Alif Lamed. So Ail. So the word Ail in Hebrew means God, a God, a deity. So there, there are names in Hebrew that are called theophoric names. So names that have the name of God embedded within them as a suffix or a prefix. For example, Gabriel, or Gabriel, or the strength of God, or Mikael, Michael. And the name Michael is a rhetorical question. Who is like God? That's what his name means. Who is like God? Mikael. Uh, Elijah, Eliyahu. My God is Yahu, one of the names of God according uh, to rabbinical scripture and the, in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. Anything that has ale in it, the L, right? L, Ron Hubbard, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> just a joke. You have to be careful with Scientology, they'll, they'll sue you. <laughs> you have to be careful. You have to be very careful. Yeah, so, so uh, this is an ancient Semitic name of God. So all Semitic languages, they called God some variation of this Aleph and Lamed. So in the Hebrew Bible, you find Eil, right? For example, in Hosea 11.9, it says, Ki anuchi Eil, velo ish, indeed, I am God, and not a human being. Eil. Sometimes Elohim is used as sort of a, 
uh, more emphatic form, like in Deuteronomy 32, 17, I believe, it says, you know, the pagans, they, uh, they sacrifice to shaydim, shayatim, to demons, and not to elo, not to God. So elo, an emphatic form of el, is used in the, in the Tanakh as sort of in juxtaposition to false gods. Elo is el with emphasis. And then you have the very common Elohim, like Genesis 1.1, the very first verse of the Torah says, Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim. Right? In the beginning, God, with a plural, created the heavens and the earth. So um, Muslim exegetes of the Bible, Muslim biblicists, if you will, I'm one of them, uh, and Jewish scholars will say that this plural is a plural of, of not numbers, but a royal plural. It's called a plural, pluralis majestatis in Latin, right? It's kind of like when the Queen of England says, we declare, but she's only one person. But she's speaking from a vantage point of authority, apparently, maybe not anymore for the Queen of England, but, um, but God does. Uh, so God uses the plural for Elo, he says Elohim, right? Uh, and then, uh, that's in Hebrew. Now, most scholars believe that Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, uh, spoke a language called Syriac, and he was probably very multilingual. I mean, the, the official language of the Roman Empire was Latin, but in that area in the ancient Near East, it was Koine Greek, right? So he probably knew some Greek. Paul is the first author of the New Testament. He wrote in Greek. The four Gospels are in Greek, right? Um, the language of the general populace was Syriac, or sort of sometimes called late Aramaic, Christian Aramaic. And then the language of the synagogue liturgy was in Hebrew. So he probably knew several languages, right? But when he would communicate to, you know, the people in Galilee, he would give his sermons, he probably did that in Syriac. So it's Christian scholars in the fourth century, they translated the Greek manuscripts, the four gospels, into Syriac, going back into the original language of Christ, um, because the originals are in Greek. And this 4th century translation into Syriac is known as a Peshitta. In Arabic it's called the Besitta, which means like simple, simple Syriac. Uh, and this replaced uh, diates the Diatessera notation. So in the 2nd century, a, a student of Justin Martyr, he actually harmonized all four Gospels and put them into a single narrative, and he wrote it in Syriac. Uh, so that was quite popular, in fact was, was popular even um, into the Middle Ages and the Middle East churches. Uh, but uh, most Christian scholars wanted to keep those Gospels separate, so it was translated into Syriac. Anyway, uh, in Mark, Jesus says, according to the Peshitta, he says, Shlam le zimna, ve malkutha da Allaha. He says, the hour has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God, Malkutha de Allah, the kingdom of God is at hand. So in Syriac, the language of Christ, uh, the word for God is Allah. And this is the same, the cognate is Allah in Arabic. Right? So the Muslim claim, this is where I'm going to get a little, maybe a little touchy. Um, the Muslim claim is that all the prophets were Muslim. Because the word Muslim does not mean, uh, does not literally mean a follower of Muhammad, right? If you read ancient, or not ancient, but Orientalist literature about Islam, oftentimes Muslims are called Muhammadin, Muhammadin, meaning that they follow Muhammad. I don't necessarily have a problem with this term. Uh, however, um, the Quran does not use the term Muhammadin. It uses Muslim, and the Prophet himself was a Muslim. So the term Muslim is an active parcel of Islam. So Muslim is to Islam as Christian is to Christianity. Uh, so I'm mentioning that because I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, are you Islam? <laughs> and I think, wow, that's kind of a deep question. <laughs> Am I Islam? Wow. I don't know, maybe. Okay. It's awesome. Um, so the word Muslim means someone who submits to God's will with the intention of creating peace. So the word Muslim is actually related to the Hebrew shalom. Salam, shalom. Right? They have a common etymology, Hebrew and Arabic and Syriac. All of these languages are sister languages. They have a common etymology. Uh, so Muslims will say 
that Abraham was a Muslim, mm -hmm. that Moses was a Muslim, um, that uh, David was a Muslim, that Jesus and Mary uh, were Muslims, and that Muhammad was a Muslim. So the Quran also has a very clear criticism of Christian theology, right? Um, now there's a difference of opinion about the state of the New Testament. Like what is the Quran actually saying about the Christian scriptures? Uh, there's some ambiguity there. Uh, it's sort of an enigmatic relationship between the Quran and the Christian scriptures, the recognized Christian scriptures. Most scholars would say that the Quran is saying that the Christian scriptures have been corrupted in its text. That there are different versions of them, that scribes went in, they falsified things. Right? There is an element of truth within them, uh, but um, the Qur'an has been preserved and the Qur'an uh, will uh, confirm those authentic aspects uh, of the New Testament. Uh, the minority opinion is that the New Testament is sound in its text. Right? However, the quote-unquote corruption comes in the post-apostolic um, Christian exegetical tradition, uh, interpreting certain things, for example, the Gospel of John, through the lens of Trinitarianism, which Muslims do not believe is a teaching of Christ. Uh, for example, I give you an example. Um, Jesus says in John 10 30, the Father and I are one. Right? He says, Ha pater kai ego heis esmen. The Father and I are one in the Greek. Right? Uh, this sort of standard normative, if you will, Muslim position regarding that is, well, Jesus could never have said that because that's a claim to deity and Jesus was a prophet and it's inauthentic. That's the most kind of popular way of dealing with the text, sort of a lazy way of dealing with the text. However, uh, there is an opinion, again, like I said, that the Quran is actually saying that the text of the New Testament is sound so there isn't a problem with the text, there's a problem in the exegesis of the New Testament. So the Father are one, Muslims who confirm that text and say, well, what does Jesus actually mean when he said that? Right? Is he talking about you know, an ontological oneness with God? What is he talking about? So we read the, uh, the context. Jesus is referring to the disciples, and he says, you know, no one can snatch them out of my hand, his disciples. And the Father, who is greater than all, is watching over them. No one can snatch them out of his hand. The Father and I are one. So Muslims will say here, Muslim biblicists who engage in this type of hermeneutic of the New Testament, they will say that, in other words, entertaining the text is authentic. They will say the meaning of this passage is that Jesus and God are of one will. They have, they have, they're one in their intention. That there's a mystical union between Jesus and Jesus and God, not ontological union. Now, um, and evidence of that is found in the Quran. For example, there's a verse in the Quran that says, in Arabic it sounds like this, Rasul faqad ata Allah. The transla literal, tra literal translation is, whoever obeys the messenger of God is obeying God. Right? So this does not mean that the messenger is ontologically the same person as God, that they share a being, Right, where they share divine attributes. It means that the messenger is a sanctified agent of God, that he speaks with God's authority. Right? Um, so if we look at something like John, the prologue of the Gospel of John, where Jesus is called Theos. Theos means God. Right? But it's interesting because a contemporary of John's Gospel, Philo of Alexandria, in his life of Moses, and Philo was obviously a Jew, he refers to Moses as Theos. So what's going on here with, with Greek during this period? Why are writers referring to men as Theos? So what Philo means there is that Moses is a divine agent, with the lowercase d, right? That Moses is the revelator of God's will, that he's in mystical union with God, that he only does those things that are pleasing to God, that when he speaks, it is as if God is speaking, because he is the sanctified agent of God. So when we read something like uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, for example, it says, in archaein halagas, in the beginning was the word. Kai halagas, in prastan theon. 
And the word was with the God, Tan Theon. Tan is a definite article. So Tan Theon, my contention is, every time the Gospel of John uses Tan Theon, or any, any Gospel for that matter in the New Testament, when there's a definite article, it's a reference to the Father. And the word was with the God, Father. And then it says, Kai Theos Eng Halagos. And a God, a Theos, uh, was the word. No definite article. And that's exactly how Philo uses that term in reference to Moses. Uh, that Jesus is a divinity with a lowercase d. He is a sanctified agent of God. He reveals God's will. The end of the prologue, it says, uh, something very beautiful, it says, uh, no one has at any time seen God. And it says, monogenes thaios, right? Mono, one, the one of a kind divine agent, the unique sanctified agent of God, monogenes theos, that who is in the bosom of the Father, the bosom of the Father, meaning he's in the heart of the Father, meaning he's beloved of the Father, that one, exegesato in the Greek, that one exegetes him, right? So no one has at any time seen God, but there is this person called the unique sanctified agent of God who's beloved of the Father, and that one reveals the Father. You know, gives us what's in Arabic is called ma'rifah, an intimate knowledge of God. In Hebrew, da'at ilohim. Like, Jesus is that. You know, to be honest with you, if uh, I was a Muslim, I would probably just revile Islam, if that's all I knew about if that's the only type of information that was being presented to me about the religion. So I don't blame a lot of people for having misconceptions and hostility. I would also have hostility if I believed that what they were saying was true. Um, so I think the key then is education. You know? So wisdom with academic rigor, as the Quran says, and also with, the exegetes say, what, you know, beautiful exhortation, with like good, with a good attitude, with with good comportment, right? And then, and then engage with them. And jadid, you know, jigad, it can be translated as you know, debate or discourse, academic inquiry, to be critical, right? Some people, you know, have a misconception again that you know, Muslims are not allowed to be critical about their own text. You can't engage in textual criticism or higher, higher Quranic criticism. No, that's something that our scholars definitely engaged in. In fact, there's, in fact, they would say that the Quran itself invites upon itself this type of higher criticism. The Quran says, Quran, which means don't they penetrate the meanings of the Quran? Tadabur in Arabic means to really analyze something extremely closely. Right? Um, so engage with people in ways that are good, you can translate it good, you can translate it better, you can translate it beautiful. Engage with people in ways that are beautiful. So this is what I think we need to do. I think we need to engage with academic sophistication, with civility, uh, and um, we need to. Uh, the goal, I think, is not necessarily to agree, uh, but to at least understand the position of the, the so-called other. Um, uh, so. Um, the other point I wanted to make is, from a historical standpoint, um, you know, what is the Qur'an saying then about Christianity? So the Qur'an is, like I said, is critical of Christian theology. That's kind of across the board amongst Muslim scholars, unless one is a perennialist, which is sort of a new thing, but most traditional authorities would say that the criticism of Christianity in the Qur'an are really of Christian theology and whether it's criticized in the text of the New Testament or not, like I said, there's a difference of opinion. So the Quran, for example, uh, will explicitly uh, repudiate the Trinity, right? Uh, and exegetes will say, for example, that you know, the verse that says, don't say Trinity, God is one, uh, that uh, this was a historical development within the church, that's not the teaching of Christ. Also the idea of, a, of Christ being a divine incarnation, right? So Muslims believe and similar to Jewish theology, that God is utterly transcendent of space, time, and materiality. Uh, this does not mean that God is an imminent in some sense, right? So the God of Islam is not some removed deity of Plato or Aristotle, or he's basically an absentee landlord, right? Or he never collects the rent, 
just do whatever you want and I'll never check up on you. He doesn't reach out to humanity. No, the God of Islam is an imminent deity. The Quran says, It says, we are closer, royal plural, we are closer to the human being than his or her jugular vein. Right? So the, the, closer than, a, than an internal organ. So God's imminence is there. But God's mercy and love are imminent, not God in physicality. As Muslim scholars would say that, uh, that God incarnating into flesh and blood, as it were, is inconceivable, because nothing is like God whatsoever. So there's a difference of opinion there. Also, I mentioned earlier that the God of Islam is a merciful God. This is evident, again, if you read the Qur'an, every chapter of the Qur'an begins with the refrain, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the, uh, the indiscriminately compassionate, the intimately loving. So Rahman is one of the most common names of God in the Quran. Rahman, right? And in Hebrew, Rahman, in, in, at least in rabbinical literature. Uh, and this word is related to Rechem. Rechem in Hebrew means the womb of a mother. So one of the greatest names of God in the Quran is related to the word for womb. So exegetes have struggled with that connection, and they've said that things like the purest type of love on earth between human beings is the love of a mother for her child. Right? And Rahman, the name of God, is on a form in Arabic, a grammatical form that is a type of superlative, that God is infinitely more loving towards his creation than a mother is to her child. Right? Muslims also believe that people are saved by grace, not by action. And this is also a very, very common misconception that's perpetuated by non-Muslims. That Muslims believe that, you know, that if you're 51% good and 49% evil, ah, oh, you just made it into heaven. <laughs> if 41, for 51% evil and 49% good, oh, you, you know, you just, you're going to go to hell. And you just missed it. And so, so salvation is by grace. I mean, there was a sort of uh, a rationalist movement within early Islam called the Mu'tazila movement. And they actually took the caliphate for some time, uh, which is not considered you know, normative or orthodox by Sunni uh, orthodoxy. That did believe in sort of a tit-for-tat, you know, literal sort of weighing of deeds on the Day of Judgment, and uh, God sort of becomes this huge cosmic calculator in the sky. Uh, but there are many, many hadith of the prophets uh, which demonstrate that Muslims believe that salvation is through grace, that no one is worthy of paradise, right? It's only through grace. Um, for example, uh, there's a hadith of the Prophet where he says that, uh, that God, he, he called the two men out of hellfire, right? <laughs> so two men come out of the hellfire and they come towards God as it were. Again, God does not occupy physical space, but this is just sort of a teaching moment that he's using. And God says to both of the men, okay, go back to hell. So one man reluctantly turns around and starts walking back, but keeps looking over his shoulder at God. The other man turns around immediately and starts sprinting towards hell. So God says to the man who keeps turning around, and God knows better, obviously, because God is all-knowing, but the prophet is trying to make a theological point here. So God says to the man who keeps turning around, why do you keep looking at me? And the man says, well, you called me out of hell, and I was hoping I didn't have to ever go back. And God says, you're right. Go to paradise. And then he stops the man who's sprinting. <laughs> he says, why are you sprinting towards hell? And the man said, my whole life I disobeyed you. But this time, I really want to obey you. <laughs> and God says, good, go to paradise. Okay. Uh, so ultimately, the, the decision is in God's hands. Even the prophet said, you know, one time he was picking up some firewood. And this is mentioned in a hadith. And he said, you know, to the, to the companions that were there, he said, you know, no one has entered into paradise by their deeds. And they said, not even you. And he said, not even me, except that my Lord envelops me in his mercy. All right? So this is the dominant position. This is the quote unquote, I can use these terms in here because I'm not in the academy. This is the orthodox normative position of Islam, the vast majority of Muslims, this is what they believe, that salvation is by grace. Um, uh, so, and that God is personal. So at this point, let's see, you know, we're doing here. I think I'll stop yapping and take some questions. Yes, sir? 
does the Quran uh, address the death of Christ? Ah, good question. Yes, that was on uh, my mind here. Yeah, so the Quran, um, uh, according to the dominant opinion, uh, categorically rejects the crucifixion of Jesus. So the Quran says, وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا سَلَبُهُ So the children of Israel did not kill him nor crucify him. So the dominant opinion is that Christ wasn't crucified, that somehow God saved him. Now the Quran does not go into details as to what happened, and neither does the Prophet. So later Muslim scholars, they have these sort of theories as to what actually happened. So the most dominant theory, again, this is not the definitive answer. There is no definitive answer as to what actually happened. But the most dominant theory is that a disciple was transfigured to look like Christ, and he was the one crucified. Um, now, if you look at Christian history, we know that there was a group in the first century called the Basilidians, uh, who actually believed that Simon of Cyrene was crucified instead of Christ. This is obviously a, a, a pre-Islamic belief prevalent in the Christian community, end of the first century, early second century. Who's Simon of Cyrene? Well, if you read the, four, if you read the three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, it says that when they were going to crucify Jesus, uh, for some reason, they, the Romans pulled a man out of the crowd, right? And uh, Christian tradition teaches that Jesus was just so exhausted that he couldn't carry the cross, right? It doesn't mention that in the New Testament. So it's quite enigmatic, but for some reason, they pulled this man out of the crowd and Simon of Cyrene, and they compelled him to bear the cross. Right? So there was a group of Christians in the first century who said Simon was in fact crucified because they saw the death of the Messiah as sort of an oxymoron. How can the Messiah die? This was the main reason why most Jewish elements did not believe in Christ. Because according to their understanding, at least, of the Old Testament, the Messiah cannot be killed. He won't dash his foot against the stone, as it says in Psalm 91. And interestingly, none of the passages in the Old Testament that Christians will use as proof texts of the death of the Messiah, the most famous of which is, of course, Isaiah, 19, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, the word Messiah does not appear in any of those texts. So the interpretation is somewhat open. But in Psalm 20, verse 6, very interestingly, uh, David writes, in Hebrew he says, David says, I know that God will save his Messiah. He shall hear him uh, from his holy heaven and save him with the saving power of his right hand. Right? So this is, um, so I would say that the Muslim belief about the Messiah is uh, in line with sort of pre-Christian Jewish expectations of the Messiah. So that's a dominant opinion, that he wasn't, he wasn't crucified or killed. Uh, there's, uh, there's other opinions that it might have been Barabbas. So if you look at early Alexandrian manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew, um, were actually given the first name of Barabbas. You know. So this whole incident of you know, the Pontius Pilate releasing a Jewish prisoner, this seems to be sort of unhistorical. Uh, you know, you have two sort of, you know, on Yom Kippur, you have two lambs, you kill one, you set one free. It's, it's sort of something going on like that. But if we just entertain the story for now, apparently the Romans had this custom where they would release a Jewish prisoner as an act of goodwill before Passover. Uh, so they bring out two prisoners, one is named Barabbas, one is named Jesus of Nazareth, right? So according to the, the popular story in Matthew, um, you know, who shall I release to you? And the crowd cheers and they release Barabbas and they crucify Jesus, right? And what's interesting is the word Barabbas is not his name, it's a title. Barabbas in Aramaic is Bar Abba. Bar Abba means the son of the father. So Barabbas is not some ordinary brigand. He is a messianic claimant. He was from Galilee, and the Galileans were known for two things, fishing and zealotry. Or as the Romans would say, fishing and terrorism. Right? Because they would, they would organize these insurrections against the Roman occupiers. Jesus is from Galilee. You know, the Galileans also had this sort of accent that was very... Uh, <laughs> Uh, noticeable, you know, sort of like a, 
if someone you know speaks, you know, if someone is from the south or something, and they start speaking, they say, oh, this guy's. It, it was very noticeable, and the rest of the Jews, at least the Jews in Judea, would sort of characterize them as sort of peasants. You know, they just they don't know anything, and they're all violent, and you know. So that's why it says in the Gospel of Matthew that when Peter spoke in, Jer in Judea, in Jerusalem, from his accent, they said, "Are you are you Galilean?" So that's why they said, "No, you're you're his disciple then, just from the way he spoke." But anyway, <clears throat> so Barabbas is a messianic claimant. Now, early, as I said, early manuscripts of Matthew actually give us Barabbas' first name. Does anyone know what his first name was? Was also Jesus. So why did later scribes remove Jesus, Barabbas' first name in the Gospel of Matthew? Because there might have been some confusion, maybe. Who was actually crucified? As you can imagine, what is Pilate actually saying now? Who shall I release to you? Yeshua bar Abba, Jesus, the Son of the Father, or Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, who is called Christ. It's the same name and the same title. You know, release Jesus and kill Jesus. What? <laughs> so, many scholars believe that the first name of Barabbas was removed for reverential reasons, but it could be that there was confusion amongst the people in Jerusalem at the time as to who was actually crucified. However, there is a minority opinion that Jesus was in fact killed amongst Muslim scholars. It's a minority opinion. There's a good book on this by Todd Lawson. He's a, he's a good scholar, Todd Lawson. It's called Crucifixion in the Quran. And his contention is the first exeget ever to say that Jesus was replaced on the cross, which is called literal docetism, by the way. The first exeget ever to say that was a Christian exeget, not a Muslim exeget. It was a man named John Damascene, who was an 8th century Christian scholar who lived in Damascus. He was the first one to write a systematic refutation of Islam. So his interpretation of that text is that someone was replaced, and then it seems like Muslim scholars sort of followed suit after him. But there is a minority opinion that the meaning of the verse, they did not kill him nor crucify him, but it was made to appear so unto them, is that Jesus might have been put on a cross, but he didn't die from his injuries, that God seized his soul while he was on the cross and then returned it to him possibly three days later. This might explain why Pilate in the Gospel of Mark was so surprised that Christ had died already. You know, in the Gospel, it's only mentioned by Mark. They come back to Pilate and say, he's dead. And he says, already? And he marveled, it says, because he was a, he, he made, he was, he, his whole business was crucifying Jews, right? And I, I mean, um, Josephus says that at one point they actually ran out of lumber in Jerusalem because they are crucifying so many Jews. So he knew what it took to crucify someone to have them, what it took to kill them. Yet he marveled. Um, and this might explain, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It seems like he's sort of willingly giving up the ghost or knows it's going to be taken from him and then returned to him. So there is an opinion like that. Because there's other places in the Quran uh, where Jesus... Um, where God says to Jesus, for example, and the, you can very easily translate that as, oh Jesus, I'm going to take your soul from you. You don't have to, you don't have to twist the text. I mean, that's, that's a primary definition of that active participle. You, know, you don't have to perform what I call, uh, what do I call it? Hermeneutical warboarding. <laughs> if, you, if you choke the text enough, it'll say whatever you want it to say. <laughs> right? So I would say there is a genuine difference of opinion as to what the Quran is saying about the crucifixion. The dominant opinion seems to be, is, not seems to be, the dominant opinion is that Christ was not crucified. What happened? Nobody knows. There's a minority opinion that he might have been killed, but his soul was returned to him by God. And his resurrection is proof that he indeed was the Messiah. Right? Uh, and then he commissioned his disciples to go and spread the gospel. Both positions are correct, according to the Quran. In my opinion, I mean, there, I think there would be some Muslims that would disagree with me on that. Yes? I'm afraid he's going to say we're out of time. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I tend to go on. Long yeah, this is great. I noticed you called God the God. <coughs> oh, sorry. You called the God of Islam He. Yeah. <laughs> Want an explanation? <laughs> well, Muslims believe that God has a white chromosome. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
understood. So in Arabic, as well as Hebrew, there's something you have to understand about the grammar. So every noun in Arabic and in Hebrew has a gender assigned to it. Every noun. Sometimes it's obvious what's known as natural gender. And again, this is also a point of contention, contention nowadays. But traditionally, uh, a boy was masculine. So walad is the word for boy, or in Hebrew, yelid. So the, uh, the ism ishara, the demonstrative pronoun would be masculine, right? So even the pronoun, demonstrative pronouns in Arabic and in Hebrew are genderfied. So I would say, hada waladun, this is masculine, a boy, right? Or in Hebrew I say, zeh yelid, this is a boy, natural gender. But sometimes it's, there is no natural gender, right? For example, the moon, no natural gender. So Arabs in the distant past, and Jews in the distant past, they would just assign a gender. We don't really know why they would assign male or female, but they would just assign gender. So they decided the moon is masculine, and the sun is feminine in Arabic. Right? So God does not have a gender. The Quran says, There's nothing like God whatsoever. There's nothing like God. So nothing in creation resembles God. So if we're male and female, if we're black and white, if we're made of matter, if I'm standing on something, if I'm breathing, none of these things apply to God. God is completely dissimilar to his creation, essentially. But the word Allah is grammatically masculine. It's, so it has a lexical gender. So because it has a lexical gender of masculinity assigned to it, in the Quran, it says, Huwa, he is. He is. Right? It doesn't mean God is male. And anyone who says God is male, Muslim scholars would say, that's anathema. He's, uh, that position is not acceptable. They would consider that blasphemy to say God is male or female. But God uses a masculine pronoun because the word Allah has a grammatical gender. The, gr the grammatical gender of the name of God is masculine. It does not mean that God has a natural gender, though. Yes? About the image, the made an image of God. Is that yeah. So that's interesting, because uh, that is in Genesis 2, and there's also a hadith of the Prophet. So it's not in the Quran, but there's a hadith of the Prophet, where it says, خَلَقَ اللَّهُ آدَمَ عَلَى سُورَتِهِ Basically, God created Adam. And here, Adam does not mean the person Adam. Generic, the human being, Adam, right? God created the human being in His image, right? So Muslim scholars and this, you know, Maimonides also deals with this verse. Maimonides does not believe in divine incarnation; he is anti-anthropomorphism. Maimonides says the meaning of this, as well as Imam Ghazali, they both say that the meaning of this is what is this image of God? The image of God is the ability to reason. That's God's quote-unquote image. God doesn't have a physical image. So God created a human being with the ability to reason. Just as God has infinite knowledge, he's qualitatively omniscient, human beings also have that ability. And this is our differentia, to use Aristotelian nomenclature. What, what, what makes the human being different than the animals? It isn't my physical strength. You know, put me in a room with a, a lion, I'm done, right? Uh, it's not our, you know, my eyesight. Uh, the eagle can spot a fish underwater from two miles up in the air. So what makes us different? Why can we build skyscrapers and do trigonometry? Is because of our intellect. So that's the so-called image of God, according to Maimonides and according to uh, Imam al-Ghazali, who's uh, sort of the Maimonides or Aquinas of Islam, because God doesn't have a physical image. It's the ability to reason. Yeah. Of course, there have been anthropomorphists in Islamic history that believe God has limbs and he sits on a physical throne and things like that. Uh, but it's considered a deviant position, at least according to the normative Sunni and Shia understandings of theology. Yes? Uh, Dr. Lee. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I believe I heard you say that uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is considered the final messenger. Yeah. Can you expand upon that, please? Yeah, so there's a distinction that Muslim scholars make between a prophet and a messenger. So 
So a prophet in Arabic is Nabi, or Nabi in Hebrew. A messenger is called the Rasul. So the difference at a very basic level is that a prophet uh, is someone who uh, is guided by God to reaffirm the previous uh, dispensation. Um, what's an example I can use here? Uh, that uh, Aaron is a prophet, right? But Moses is a messenger. So Moses is receiving a, a, a revelation, right? Receiving the words of God, the law of God, and Aaron supports him, right? So, so if, if looking at it through that type of way, then every messenger is a prophet, but not every prophet is a messenger. So the prophet Muhammad is the final messenger, which makes him the final prophet of God, the final one who's going to bring a direct revelation from God, right? And if you look at history, I would say that really the, the last major religion was Islam. I mean, there have been other things uh, since then. One can argue for Mormonism or Scientology. Uh, but um, <laughs> that was the last major, I mean, such an in, incredible impact on the world. That does not mean that there are not prophetic figures to come after him. I would say, for example, that Martin Luther King was a prophetic figure. But I wouldn't call him a prophet. Right? So Muslims have a very technical definition of a prophet. They have to sort of fall between uh, parameters of time. They have to have certain characteristics. And, however, the Quran says that every nation received a prophet. So the most, um, some uh, uh, 25 or so prophets are named in the Quran. But that's not by any means an exhaustive list. So, you know, the jury is out about Confucius, about Buddha. Krishna, these could have been prophets, they fall within Aristotle or Plato, probably not Plato, no, not Plato, definitely. Um, <laughs> kind of strange guy. Um, <laughs> the ancient Greeks don't need that. Um, uh, so, uh, but the prophet said that there's no prophet between Jesus and me. So again, the disciples are prophetic characters, and the Quran praises them, right? But the definition of a Nabi, a prophet, and Judaism and in Islam is very technical, very specific. So the dominant orthodox opinion amongst the Jews is that prophecy is closed with Malachi, right? So um, the prophet Muhammad is, is not a prophet according to the dominant opinion in Judaism um, uh, because I mean, according to them, he doesn't sort of fit the criteria of what they believe to be a prophet. One of those criteria is a prophet must uh, completely confirm the Torah, right? Um, so also this is, it seems to be one of the reasons why they deny Christ prophecy, uh, is that Jesus, even according to the New Testament, seems to sort of make amendments and addendums to the Torah at times, right? And for them, that's blasphemy, right? So like Jesus, you know, he heals a man on the Sabbath. Uh, and they say, you, you can't do that, that's, that's impermissible, he says. Uh, well, you know, if one of your animals fell into a hole, you pull it out. It's okay to do good things on the Sabbath. He's, he's sort of, uh, he's revising things. He's ameliorating the law. He's making it easier. And that's what the Quran says he's doing, that Christ is doing. Um, so the best opinion you'll get about Jesus from a Jewish perspective is that he was a great rabbi. But he's certainly not a prophet. He's not the Messiah, according to them. The, the most congenial opinion you get about Muhammad from a Jewish perspective is that he was a go'el, which means like a redeemer or someone who, who was guided by God, but he's not a prophet. He sort of prepared the world for monotheism. He was an Arab a prophet, maybe, but he's not a universal prophet. Maimonides actually writes, you know, what is, the, what is the purpose of Christianity and Islam? He says it's to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. They're raising awareness about the Messiah. But Jews do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Yes. Um, we in this room have decided that we're going to become followers of Muhammad. <laughs> what teachings in the Quran are we going to have to find the biggest barrier to acceptance? 
What teachings? Um, I don't know, maybe dietary restrictions? <laughs> if you like ham and eggs, I mean, it's <laughs> tough. I mean, you have to pray five times a day. It doesn't, it doesn't, if, you know, there are uh, one out of five human beings on earth is Muslim, and I seriously doubt all of them pray five times a day. So it doesn't invalidate one's Islam, right? You can't say, oh, you're a non Muslim because you don't pray five times a day. But if one wants to be a devout follower, then they fast during Ramadan. That seems to be, I mean, in the first couple of days, you got like a, like a massive migraine. <laughs> you kind of just want to. But then after a couple of weeks, you kind of get used to it. So it's a 30-day fast, and of course, if people are sick or pregnant mothers or children, they're exempt from fasting. People that have illnesses, you know, um, uh, praying five times a day and the dietary restrictions. I don't, I don't see what else could be hampering. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps one of the things we share yeah. is uh, poor treatment of women, uh, which is prevalent in the New Testament, in my opinion. Um, but the Islam does not have a good feeling to me on that score, and I yeah. would appreciate it if you talk about that. Yeah, and you know, I don't have a good feeling about talking about women issues when I'm not a woman, to be honest with you. Uh, so I always encourage, if there's a, is there a Muslim sister in the house? No. So I always encourage women to speak for themselves. Uh, but I would say that uh, certainly there are Muslim countries, Muslim majority countries, uh, where women are um, treated as sort of, uh, well, less than, less than men. They're considered, they don't have all the rights of men, basically. So this comes down to a fundamental understanding of, of sacred law of Sharia. Right. What is Sharia? What is Sharia? Right? And one of those words that people are scared of. Sharia, jihad. Right? Ah, no. um, so Sharia, according to Rick Santorum, um, <laughs> so Rick Santorum, he gave it a, he gave a impassioned lecture on on the dangers of Sharia law and how it debases women and things like that. Uh, long, you know, hour and a half lecture, and very good actually, uh, I guess. Uh, but then after the lecture. Um, a Muslim college student approached him and said, Mr. Santorum, do you know the five maqasid of sharia? Do you know the five aims of the sharia, which is like Sharia 101? And he said, maqasid? What? So that's like the equivalent of me giving this sort of critical deconstruction of Aquinas's Summa Theologica, where I'm breaking down the Latin, and I'm over here he's wrong because of that, and over here he's out of his mind, and then a Christian stands up and says, what are the four gospels? And I say, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. <laughs> so, Sharia is, you know, it's, it's, it's interpreted in vastly different ways. So some Muslims interpret Sharia uh, in a way that oppresses women. Saudi Arabia, which is our ally, by the way, uh, and a contributor to the Clinton Foundation. Anyway, um, they, they interpret, uh, they, uh, in, interpret the Sharia as being that women can't drive cars. That's the only country that does that, maybe except for Afghanistan. If you go to Iran, half the, you know, one of those other words, Iran, the axis of evil, right? If you go to Iran, half of the physicians in the hospitals are women, and 60% of college students are women. If you ask the authorities in Iran, why is this so? They'll say, look, Sharia. The Prophet said, Talabul ilm, faridatun ala kulli muslim wa muslima. The, uh, the acquisition of knowledge is an obligation upon every male and female Muslim. That's what they'll say. You go across the border to Afghanistan, you'll, you'll, you'll see villages where women never leave their homes, ever. They're in their house. And if you ask the authorities, why do you do this to women? They'll say, this is Sharia. <laughs> so you have, you have you know, these completely polarized understandings of sacred law, you know. So um, I would say that, you know, speak, speak to Muslim women. Ask Muslim women how, how they feel about it, if they feel like they're oppressed. And Muslim women that wear hijab, you know, in America, oftentimes uh, are opposed by their family members. Because the sort of assumption is, who's forcing you to wear that? 
do you have some father or brother that's forcing you? And they say, they say no, actually, my, my father is opposed to it. This is what I chose to do. Right? Um, so, uh, I would say that, that it, it depends on how one interprets the Sharia. And certainly, culture comes into play a lot in the Muslim majority world. Like, honor killings has nothing to do with Islam. There's nothing anyone can bring, no proof, no hadith, no Quranic verse that says you have, you, that killing someone, an innocent person, is honorable. That's purely it's cultural. And it's, and it's done in, in Middle Eastern cultures, amongst Christians, amongst Hindus, and amongst Muslims. It's totally cultural. Female genital mutilation is not according to Sharia. That is a cultural practice and nothing to do with Islam. Right. All right, so we have, we have time for two more questions. Uh, How do you spell Sharia? S-H-A-R-I-A-H. Yeah. I mean, there are things in Jewish law. Jewish law is called halakha. You know, and if you get, if you, if you study Jewish law, you'll read about stonings and amputations. And, but there are Jews in America that follow halakha. You know, so how do they interpret the law, their law, and how of the Constitution? Well, there's a principle in Jewish law that says, that if you're living in a non-Jewish country, uh, you have to follow the laws of those countries, of that country. And by doing so, you're actually following Jewish law. And it's interesting because people, they bring that argument up about Muslims, that the Sharia and the Constitution, uh, they just, they're not compatible, right? But that same principle is in Islamic sacred law. Now, if you're living in a non-Muslim majority country, and there's something lawful in Sharia, but unlawful in that non-Muslim majority country, then you must abandon the Sharia and stick to that, the law of the land. And by doing so, you're actually following the Sharia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's why I think people need to uh, they need to study Muslim tradition. You know, a rejection of tradition becomes violent. You know, we've seen this. I mean, I don't mean any disrespect, but you know, the progress of Reformation led to massive bloodshed all across Europe because of rejection of tradition. You know, so I think there's an educational crisis amongst Muslims um, all around the world. Uh, people don't know what the traditional positions are on things. So what they do is they try to interpret the text by themselves without requisite knowledge. And it's absolutely Islam 101 that if someone is going to give some sort of teaching on anything on the Quran, they have to have a teaching license. Just like if, you know, if someone wants to perform open heart surgery on someone, you have to have credentials. You know, so it's not enough to say, you know, when, like when Jesus was in Jerusalem, the rabbis surround him and say, under whose authority are you doing these things? They want to know the name of his rabbi. Who is your rabbi? And then Jesus in the Gospels has this really interesting way of getting out of slippery situations. <laughs> so he says, who is John the Baptist? Is he a prophet or not? And they go, oh, we don't know. And he says, I'm not going to tell you under whose authority I do these things. It's like when they bring him that denarius and say, you know, should we pay this to Caesar? Render unto Caesar. So it's a brilliant answer what he has what he says there. So this idea of what's called senad, or transmissional knowledge, right, is very important in Islam, that I have a teacher who gave me a teaching license, who had a teacher who gave him a teaching license, that goes all the way back to the Prophet. So this ensures sort of the weeding out of these sort of freelance, you know, so-called pseudo-scholars who stand on the pulpit and just interpret the Quran incorrectly. You know, so we have to be very particular about uh, our religious knowledge and who we take it from. Let us, you know, so this is the, one of the major problems with Paul, uh, according to the New Testament. Paul says in one of his letters, you know, he says, I don't need letters of recommendation. I have my apocalypsis of Christ. Right? So according to the exegesis, uh, Christian exegesis, uh, James, uh, who is the, the head of the Jerusalem Episcopate, he would send apostles of Jesus in Paul's wake to correct Paul's teachings <laughs> with letters from James. 
Like, I, am, I have a teaching license. Paul doesn't. So Paul, he has this uncanny way of turning a weakness into a strength. So he says, I don't need a teaching license. I had my vision of Christ, right? And he might have had that, but that doesn't give one authority to teach. So if someone comes up to me, for example, and says, uh, I want to talk, like in a mosque, and says, I want to give the Friday sermon today. So I ask him, what are your credentials? And he says, well, I had a dream last night. <laughs> and, you know, I, I was speaking with the prophet in my dream. That might be true, but you, you can't give the sermon. You need to go and get some credentials. Or someone comes up to me and says, if I need open heart surgery, and they say, I'm a, I'm a heart surgeon. Oh, where did you do your residency? Last night. Um, <laughs> the finer points of vascular surgery were revealed to me. I would say, maybe that's true, but no, you're not going to operate. Um, so transmissional knowledge is very, very important. And I think that's something that Muslims today, uh, and I think people in general, because the whole sort of way of the world now is sort of reinvent the wheel, think for yourself. Certainly you can think for yourself, but as one of my teachers said, you should have your left hand on tradition and you should write with your right hand. You know the tradition. You, you know what it is. You know how to interpret it. You don't transgress uh, against it because then you're, you're left with people that just have no requisite knowledge that are saying whatever they want. Right? Um, so... So we have time for one more question. Yeah. The licensure that you're that you're speaking of, we we might call apostolic succession. Yeah. The episode, Not to harp on, on something, but something that hits us all the time in the news reports. Yeah. In the real news reports. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oftentimes. You mentioned Saudi Arabia, uh, the Wahhabism. Yeah. And could you could you address a little bit of that because I think that's what we oftentimes get deluged with as yeah. you know the more right. difficult. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wahhabism is um, it's a kind of puritanical, very exclusive interpretation that really wasn't around um, 200 years ago. It's a relatively new sect. Um, the reason why Wahhabism is oftentimes presented as being the dominant position or the normative position uh, is because Mecca and Medina are in Saudi Arabia, right? And also there are you know, Wahhabi full-time propagandists that just, you know, travel the world, you know, visit mosques and try to indoctrinate different Muslim mosques and uh, different Muslim communities with their brand of Islam. Um, and they also, obviously, uh, Saudi Arabia is very rich. They get money from oil and from pilgrimage, you know, billions of dollars uh, every year. So I would say that it's very problematic uh, interpretation of things. Um, and that, uh, you know, it's not, I don't consider it within the sort of parameters of traditional Islam. Traditional Islam, the Sunni Islam, is four schools of thought. They're called the Hanafi, the Maliki, the Shafi'i, and the Hanbali. Um, and for you know, 1,200 years, uh, every Sunni Muslim belonged to one of these schools of thought. It's like a university. Um, and then suddenly now we have this, this other school that rejects many of, of the positions of those traditional schools and sort of, again, reinvents the wheel and has very strange positions on things that Muslims find very disturbing, uh, to be honest with you. Um, so, you know, and of course you have uh, you know, I would, again, I'm not much of a, well, maybe I am a little bit of a conspiracy theorist, but I, I think, and I think one of the previous speakers said this before me, that, you know, there's media bias and there's an agenda. I think that's obvious. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, justifying, you know, invasion of Muslim countries is difficult to get the, the public behind you to do that. Uh, so if you sort of aggrandize this, this threat of Wahhabi Islam. I mean, it's, it's one country, and it's by no means the dominant. It's, it's a very small ideology compared to global Islam. But if you sort of aggrandize that and say, well, this is you know everywhere, and uh, most Muslims believe in this type of ideology, um, then it sort of justifies you know, action, in the, you know, uh, perpetual action in the Middle East, uh, but not in Saudi Arabia, apparently, <laughs> because you know there, there's. Trump hotels and, and <laughs> they can't be on the list. All right, so uh, 
Join me again in a round of applause.